Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Thank you guys for joining us for our fifth webinar of 2021, a part of our patient ambassador program. Uh, my name is Cece Cunningham. I'm the program manager uh, for the Chris Klug Foundation. Um, and I'll be introducing you uh, to today's panel of transplant caregivers. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank our generous sponsor, the Hearts for Rust Foundation, for their incredible support in making this monthly webinar series possible. Um, so just quick uh, you know, debrief here. So if you're new to Zoom webinar, you'll notice that you have a Q&A box uh, to field questions to the panelists on your console. So we're going to have a brief Q&A at the end. So we definitely encourage you guys to type your questions, um, but make sure they're in the Q and A box and you're using that option. Um, so just type in your questions into that box when they come to mind. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Kim Hingsley. She is the wife and former caregiver of liver transplant recipient, Brian Hinsley. Kim and Brian have been married for 24 years. And um, when they tied the knot, Brian was already showing signs of liver failure due to his ongoing battle with autoimmune hepatitis. Um, Brian continued working as a firefighter and paramedic until his disease had progressed to the point where he was eventually taken off the job. Uh, Kim cared for him throughout this entire time and accompanied him to all of his hospital visits, even while she was pregnant with their daughter, Megan. Um, so during Brian's time on the transplant list, a film crew produced a documentary about Kim's and Brian's relationship and transplant journey. It's titled No Greater Love. Um, and after his successful liver transplant, Brian became the first firefighter uh, slash paramedic ever to return to the line of duty post organ transplant. So today, Kim and Brian are both retired and they live in North Carolina with their daughter. Um, and although Kim doesn't consider herself to be Brian's caregiver anymore, she fondly refers to herself as her husband's care partner instead. So next up, we have Noah Kiefer. Noah Kiefer, Kiefer has been a caregiver and patient advocate for his wife, Valen, for the past 14 years. Uh, together, they have navigated Valen's battle Valen's battles with epilepsy, back surgery, kidney disease, kidney transplant, multiple bouts of sepsis, and liver transplant. Whew. Noah became involved with the Chris Kluge Foundation when he nominated Valen for CKF's annual Bounce Back Give Back Award in 2017. Uh, Valen subsequently won the award later that year, and Noah has continued advocating for transplant and organ donation ever since. Uh, he speaks on behalf of his wife and the foundation and visits transplant patients in hospitals across the country as part of CKF's patient ambassador program. Uh, and last but not least, we have Missy Klug. Missy Klug is the wife and former caregiver of liver transplant recipient, Olympic snowboarder, and CKF founder and namesake, Chris Klug. Missy was dating Chris when he was placed on the transplant wait list after being diagnosed with primary sclerosis and cholangitis, or PSE, in 1991. She rode out the weight with him and encouraged him as he continued his training in preparation for his first Olympic Games in 1998. Missy also stayed by his side and remained optimistic as his health deteriorated to a critical stage. Um, it was at this point that Chris received his life-saving liver transplant in 2000. Um, and Missy, along with Chris's family and the family of his deceased donor, uh, got to watch as Chris won a bronze medal at the Salt Lake City Winter Olympic Games in 2002, post-transplant. So after his Olympic success, Chris started the Chris Klug Foundation in 2003. And since then, Missy has eagerly volunteered her time and efforts for the cause, and she currently serves as treasurer of our organization. Um, so today, Chris and Missy lead super healthy, active lifestyles uh, in Aspen, Colorado, where we are located, um, with their two kids, Bali and River. Thank you uh, to all of our guest speakers for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to uh, quickly introduce the Chris Kluge Foundation and what we do. As I said, I think I kind of gave a little brief story of uh, Chris and why he founded the foundation. Really what our foundation does, we advocate for uh, organ, eye, and tissue donation. And we really want to do that through uh, emphasizing its importance and educating others on its importance. So we try to do that in a lot of different ways. We have an educational curriculum that goes out to high school and college students. We uh, promote uh, in-person at high schools and at hospitals across the country. And we also inspire those uh, who have been touched by organ donation and transplant um, by doing events like these and raising awareness through um, our patient ambassador webinar series. So thank you guys again uh, to everyone who's joining us. And I think we can dive right into the questions here. So I first wanna address Noah. 
So your wife, Valen, received her kidney transplant as a teenager, uh, certainly before you two had ever met. Uh, would you just tell us the story of, you know, how you met and became familiar with your journey through transplant and chronic illness? Yeah, absolutely, Cece. So um, Valen and I, when we were both living in Pennsylvania, we had a uh, mutual friend or uh, mutual acquaintances that introduced the two of us. And um, as, as you often do, um, I, I offered to, you know, buy her a drink. What are you drinking? I'll get you a drink. And uh, immediately I found out that she was a transplant recipient. She told me that she couldn't, she didn't drink because she was a kidney recipient. Um, and then it went on from there. So uh, uh, we just, we hit it off right away. She gave me her number and um, we met up. So the next time our actual first date, uh, I was calling to set that up with her and she was going to speak at the National Kidney uh, Caucus in Washington, DC. So uh, I knew right away I was, uh, uh, getting in with uh, with somebody special, somebody somebody driven, and uh, um, you know that was really cared about the cause and, and at the forefront of advocating for the cause, not for herself but for others as well. Um, so then uh, she was just very honest, and, and I think uh, we have a lot of people that ask us, "How do you meet somebody when you have an organ transplant?" And I think honesty is the best policy. She told me right away. Um, you know, told me about her story, kind of, um, she has a very complex background. Uh, she's been a patient since she was five years old. So um, she told me all of that right away. And um, I think it's important because you get to make the choice right then and there and, um, and kind of decide what you want to do. And for us, we just connected at that level where um, it, was a, it was a natural fit and, uh, and uh, our relationship uh, continued and, and flourished from there. Um, really then kind of transitioning into her caregiver role, Valen's a very independent person uh, as far as when it comes in regards to taking care of her health. She does an absolutely fantastic job. She's on top of it. Uh, her parents, uh, back when we were living in Pennsylvania, also played a very active role in it, and, and her health was great. So uh, my the beginning of being a caregiver for her was very minimal. I think it really my caregiver role really took over when we decided to move 2,700 miles across the country uh, with no family, no friends uh, to, a, to a new area uh, to kind of start our lives together. And that's really when I um, kind of took on the role of her caregiver for some of the other issues that uh, came up, not only with transplant, but uh, back issues, a gallbladder um, issue, and eventually her, her PKD coming back in her in her liver, leading to her uh, liver transplant, which took place uh, coming up on three years ago. Well, yeah, you guys, you know, you guys have been longtime friends of our foundation and uh, we love you and Valen. And uh, it seems like you guys are a match made in heaven. So I think it, it all worked out for the best. And um, just seeing you and having you at our events, both of you guys is so impactful, I know, for all of our audience members and um, similar to today. So thank you, Noah. I appreciate your answer. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Kim. I wanted to talk to you about your husband, Brian. Um, so I mentioned, you know, he was, Brian was already experiencing the effects of his autoimmune disease on your actual wedding day. So um, could you describe, you know, the emotions you were feeling on that day, you know, kind of with you knowing the challenges that were potentially ahead of you? Hey, listen, you know, the, the question that you had is interesting because um, I started actually, I wanted to write a book. And my first paragraph is um, walking down the aisle to Mary Bryan. And um, he was so big with his the ascites and so yellow and feeling just so nauseous as I was walking up the aisle. And I thought to myself, this guy is absolutely so sick and doesn't even want to be in this room. And um, it was so hard to say our vows when um, knowing that he wanted to just be sick off the stage of the of the where we were getting married at, and so it was a very difficult time knowing. And I was pregnant with our daughter, and um, that actually was one of the things that um, actually made him want to fight um, for this when he found out that I was that I was pregnant. And um, but. 
so about the book, I, I, I kind of think that's where I, that's where I started. That's my first paragraph because that was eye opening for me that what is going to, our lives are about to change and no one can be prepared for what we have gone through. And, um, so that's, 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 I think I answered the question that it, it how difficult it was to, um, God, watch him just deteriorate. And that was the beginning of it. Um, so many stories, you know, like Noah said about Valen, Brian hit this and wouldn't discuss this with me. Um, so this was a very different, you know, he's a type A firefighter paramedic that was not going to, he was so stubborn, hid this um, from me, wouldn't talk about it. So this is, I had to, I had to investigate. I had to do the digging. I had to find out what was going on with him. So a little bit of a different story there. So. Yeah. Yeah. And knowing where you guys are at now and, you know, how far you've come, you know, both of you as, as in your role as caregiver, Kim and uh, Brian as a patient and, you know, later on, thankfully as a transplant recipient, um, you guys have come so far and, you know, both of you guys volunteer so much of your time to um, transplant awareness, donation awareness, and uh, we appreciate all of those efforts. So I think you Thank guys you. have come a long, long way and we're happy, yeah. we're happy you guys are with <laughs> us today. <laughs> Thank you. So Missy, uh, your husband, Chris, clearly an active guy, and so are you. <laughs> Can you talk about, you know, how your support as Chris's, you know, you were his girlfriend at the time, um, and you were also sort of shifting into that role of being his caregiver. Um, how did that sort of shift, you know, impact his training? Because, you know, he was dead set on going to the Olympics. We, we all know that. And, you know, in addition, how did you view the future with such a positive outlook at that time? Well, um, yeah, Cece, as you know, Chris is very active. He has a lot of energy. Um, but as he got sicker, you know, his energy waned. And his activities changed, and we still had to be out there and and um, have that social aspect in our lives. Um, and he had to he had to view himself as still being active. So uh, just because it's a part of his being, he um, you know our activities changed. We he loves to play chess. His dad would come play chess with him. His friends would visit and play chess or just go on a walk with him. Uh, we learned how to golf. Our relationship survived him teaching me how to golf. Um, but it would be nine holes and then he'd be exhausted and um, we fly fished. You know, we, we, ch we really changed from super intense, you know, activity um, to more mellow. And, and we were really fortunate that he wasn't hospitalized before his transplant. He was still up and moving around. Actually, when he got his call for transplant, uh, we were at the gym, I was hiking, and he was at the gym uh, doing nothing but standing around talking to his friends, but he felt good about that. He was still a, a part of um, his normal life, and, um, and I think the positivity part um, kind of comes naturally to both of us. Chris doesn't really have a, a, a downtrodden side. He's I mean, trust me, there were times when your life, you start thinking about life and he was sick and, um, but he is upbeat and his parents live here and they're upbeat and everybody's, you know, he's, he's such a positive person. It was really hard to get down. And, and I, I think I helped him in that way because I'm also a positive person. So that's us. Yeah, definitely. You guys, um, the positivity surrounding the whole experience and also just surrounding, I think it really carries over into just the transplant experience as a whole. It's, um, it really is uh, infectious, not in the disease way, but in a good way. <laughs> it's infectious, that positivity. Um, and, you know, I think that's why Chris started the foundation and why the foundation has been so successful and impactful itself. So I think it all stems sure. from, you know, the both the pair of you being so positive. So sure. Thank uh, you. that's awesome. Um, Kim, I wanted to go back to you. You know, during Brian's time on the waitlist, he was on the waitlist for two years for a new liver. 
you had a film crew. This is pretty interesting. You had a film crew come to your house um, to film a documentary about your lives and relationship, but not just as, you know, a husband and wife, but also as patient and caregiver. Um, you know, can you elaborate on how it felt to be sort of seen from kind of like a, a third person or outside perspective in that context? Well, you know, um, um, they were in our house off and on for a couple of years and we were always on mic and they heard things that was rude. I hate talking about him, but it was awful. They heard many, many horrible things. And at the end of the day, when they were leaving, they used to ask me, and it was so sad. They'd say, we want to take you with us. And I said, I want to go. I want, I, I want to go with you. Anything to get out of the situation that I was in. Um, so it was, it was hard. I, I imagine what they were seeing and, um, kind of embarrassing and Brian isn't like that. He, he was just sick and fighting for his life and scared. And so I, I felt bad, but now that the film is out, um, um, I see it through other people's eyes that it's helped them, that it it showed um, how we struggled with everything uh, uh, together to just stay together, not take things personal. I think it's helped a lot of people. So at the time when it was filming, I thought I was crying all the time. I mean, the first time they interviewed me on the film, I was sitting in the kitchen and they asked me a question and I started crying and I said, cut, stop it. And then they stopped and they said, okay, Kim, we need that. And I was crying all the time. I mean, gosh, it was, it was, it was, it was really hard. Just, it, it sounds, sounds awful, but they heard horrible things. And I, and um, like I said, it, it is helped a lot of people. So I guess it was for a reason. And um, I don't know. I hope that answers the question. No, definitely. Yeah. And I think that's also another part that, you know, everyone views caregivers sort of as like in the end stage of it where they're like, okay, the transplants happened, everyone's moved on. Um, he, we're healthy, we're happy. And it's sort of that struggle, those really low points of both of, where both of you guys were at. I think that plays a huge, that's, that's, you know, that's part of the whole process. So I think right. having people see that sort of in a documentary style setting, I think is it's, it's just the reality. And, you know, that's why we're hosting this webinar today. It's all about talking about what is a caregiver, the perspective of caregiving and what that, what that does for uh, relationships and, and, you know, the individual as, a, as, a, as their own person, you know, so I there's think no book on it. There is absolutely no book on it there. This is coming. I mean, one thing I'll share that, that no one taught me. I mean, I've, I've done so much research. I've done so much on this, but the day that he wakes up next to you and he's sleeping and he's right there next to you and he looks up at you and he screams, who are you? And jumps out of bed and runs for the door. And I'm going, wait, 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 wait. I said, okay, wait, shh, close your eyes, close your eyes. Because it was just the visual of me. He did not know me. So I, I tried it. I thought, okay, well, let's just go this way. Listen to what I'm saying. Just close your eyes and listen. It's Kim. I'm your wife. I mean, who who can tell you how to do that? So those kind of things happened all the time that are not in a book. And, you know, uh, so not every patient goes through that, but I feel like we've gone through all of them. So definitely. And there's so many, you know, harsh, harsher realities about the transplant, whether it's liver, kidney, heart, lung, there are so many different aspects of it that, you know, could be another caregiver uh, with their loved one, it could be their lowest points. Um, and it's just, you know, sort of accepting that and being like, okay, yeah, this is part of the process. And it's all about getting through it and recovering uh, mentally, emotionally, and also, of course, physically. So thank you for sharing that, Kim. I know that's, you know, very touching. And I think it's helpful for a lot of people here mm -hmm. today. Thank you. <laughs> so Noah, um, obviously, as I mentioned, you and Valen are good friends with the foundation. We've certainly, you know, heard the incredible challenges Valen has had to come uh, overcome in her lifetime. So I guess asking you, you know, point blank, what were some of the most or the most challenging times or time for you as Valen's caregiver and husband? 
Yeah, CC, I, I think the, the most challenging part, if I was to put it all in a nutshell, all of us caregivers out there, you know, that are on this webinar, that are attending the webinar, that would see it sometime in the future, the hardest part is just not being able to help. I, I think that that was always the most challenging part for me as we went through this, but Val and I are very positive people, but it's just that want to help and the inability to help. And there's a couple of stories that, that, that kind of come to mind that really exemplify that and you know, trying to find a way to help. Um, I think once when Valen was diagnosed with, uh, initially she was diagnosed with PSC as the reason that her uh, liver was failing, um, or actually that she was getting infections, her liver function was okay, but she kept getting these, uh, kept getting sepsis due to uh, infections in her liver. And so we went to a PSC conference to learn more about this, this new diagnosis. And we're sitting there and we're learning about it and we're around other patients that, that have it and are learning about it or have gone through it. And, you know, PSC is a, as, as, as people that have it or as Chris, you know, knows PSC, the diagnosis is, isn't the best. I mean, there's complications as you head into transplant, there's complications, um, potential complications afterwards with it coming back in the organ and some other things that can happen with the disease. So um, we're there, we're learning about it. And it was just, we just got hit with, we're probably gonna do a transplant. You have PSC and now we're jumping right into this, this learning phase of it and just trying to hold each other's hands and help each other to, to absorb this knowledge, to absorb what we're being given. And you know, a couple hours into it, we really got to the point where we were you know, drawing funny drawings and passing them back and forth and writing notes to each other and passing them back and forth just to just to break the ice a little bit, to break the, the heaviness, to lift the heaviness of, of that conversation off of us a little bit. And then the other one would be Valen is such a positive person. Um, you know, anybody that's met her just knows she exudes it. Um, and probably one of the times that she wasn't, uh, this is going to sound like a plug, but uh, we had I, I wrote her to get the Chris Klug uh, give back, uh, bounce back give back award, and we had been selected. And we're we're you know we're in the midst of several bouts of sepsis, getting ready for transplant, and this is this is our hope we're holding on to. And uh, a couple of days before we were getting ready to leave, she came down with sepsis again, and I think that was the uh, lowest point that I had ever seen her. Um, I couldn't help. And so we're, we're going through, we're getting admitted to the hospital. They're wheeling her down to uh, her room and uh, she just, she lost it. Um, just started uh, sobbing uncontrollably. We get to the room, um, they come in to check her in and she just sent the doctors off. She didn't want to talk to anybody. So uh, that was probably the hardest. And as you can hear, it still is hard. So, um, but we found a way through it. We came back. We found that, hey, they have infusion centers in Aspen, Colorado. We want to go do this. Let's talk to the doctors. Let's figure this out. And we went through we, and we bounced back. And we ended up standing on the top of Aspen Mountain uh, for receiving the award with uh, our friends and family. And it was, it was beautiful. So that was, that was probably the hardest times. Yeah, that story is always, I wasn't, unfortunately, I wasn't here to, to you know, meet Valen that, that year. Um, I hadn't worked for the foundation yet, but I always hear that story. It always gets told. And it's just every time, like I was tearing up, just listening to you tell it. It's always such an incredible uh, story to be able to tell. And I think both of you have such, you know, you, you mentioned Valen being a positive and happy person, but I think you yeah. are too. And I think that attitude, like I was saying with Missy, um, I think that attitude really carries over. And I think it, the mental health and the emotional part of it really, really helps sort of strengthen uh, the will, I guess, if, you know, yeah. the physical will, uh, which is really, really cool to, to be able to see it sort of happen uh, in person. That's really awesome. And congratulations again to Valen for winning that award. We were so happy to have you guys here. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you guys. It really helped us through that time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Missy, you know, we're talking about, you know, uh, being at critical stages and the challenging times of transplant. Um, you know, there was a point where Chris's condition rapidly deteriorated to a critical stage. 
literally right before, I, I think right before he received his liver transplant. You know, how did you navigate this sort of just crazy whirlwind of events that happened so quickly? Um, and what role did your friends and family play during this time? Yeah, CC. I mean, again, I'll say Chris, I mean, he did go to a critical stage, uh, but again, he wasn't hospitalized. So we were really fortunate in that his body was still functioning. And um, although, you know, digestion was a problem and, and energy and, and all those things were an issue. Um, um, you know, I guess the hardest part about him when he, when he got uh, closer to transplant was just seeing him weaken because he's such a, he's such a strong, vibrant person. So seeing him take naps on the couch and not have energy to, to do things. And, um, even if it was fly fishing or something low energy, he, he did reach a point where those things became difficult. And it was, so it was hard for me because I had never seen him weak. I had never seen him in that state. So, um, you know, that was really difficult. His, you know, we have great, great friends, uh, here in Aspen and his family, again, his parents, um, played a huge role because otherwise it would have been kind of all of, on me. Um, and it, and it is nice as, as Kim said, to step away from that role for bits and pieces of your life. It, it takes over and all of your energy is, is this person who's not feeling great and who's praying every day for a second chance at life. It, it, it weighs on you. Um, but I think our faith and our, and our, family and our friends really, really helped. Everybody played their role and, and kept him upbeat and uh, believed that we would get a second chance. And, um, and of course, it's the great miracle. It happens. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, yeah, it's totally, um, you know, having, I think having that network of people, uh, to be able to lean on and having, as you and Kim both mentioned, having just some time to take for yourself because, you know, you are your own person too. And it, it, it really, I think there's a huge value in sort of keeping yourself sort of autonomous from that situation and knowing that you can sort of, okay, let's take a step back and regroup and come back and you do a better job once, once you have some, some, for sure, break. for yeah. sure. You need a break for yourself. There's no, there's no question. Definitely. It's not easy. It's not an easy process. No, Even not by any means. Yeah. So I just wanted to, before we open it up to Q and A, um, we do have, as I mentioned, a time for Q and A um, at the end. Um, but just before we do that, I want to ask my—I have my own question. I wanted to address all three of the speakers. Um, really, something uh, you know, a question that's been on my mind. You know, if there's one thing that stands out about the three of you, it's that you're all smiling. And I think the theme of this today's webinar is that you're all smiling and extremely positive. Um, but as a more general question, how did you guys, and I think Missy, we talked about this and Kim, how did you guys sort of care for yourselves in addition to caring for your loved ones? So like what role did mental health play for each of you during such, you know, these difficult times that you're facing? Anybody? I'll jump in. I'll jump in. Um, you know, when Brian was at work, because there was a period of time that he could, you know, go to work before they took him off the job. My favorite thing to do for exercise is kickboxing or Tybo. And I pretended it sounds crazy, but I pretended that my target was OK, the disease. But then sometimes him. Sorry. <laughs> and Because it's true. This was very hard on us. I really had to. Um, step back so much and i will add this i had to go to the dentist up there in the mountains where we were a couple minutes from us i welcomed the root canal that he said i needed and i said sure i'm there that got me away for an hour i anything that i i mean i you just have to step back this is so consuming you and also my mom helped me because she's a licensed clinical social worker and she helped me um I, I can't, I, that, that really probably saved me. So that, that's my take on that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Kim. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kim, I, I, you know, kind of the same with, kind of the same with you. I mean, um, you know, Valen and I were here kind of by ourselves on the, on the West coast, but our family, uh, at least back then was all on the East coast. So it was really just the two of us and, you know, my escapes, if you will, 
was going to work. I mean, I would go to work after Valen waking up in the middle of the night with sepsis, ambulance coming or taking her to the hospital, spending all night with her in the hospital. And then I'd go work a full day and people are like, why are you here? How are you doing this? And it was, you know, you're, you're in that almost survival mode and those, you know, work might, you know, it's normally stressful in a normal time, but when you're under that duress of, of transplant or, or illness, it's, it's almost the break to go into that mundane, really things don't matter that you're working on, you know, even though they do, they, they really don't matter in that, in that sense during that time. And it was a, it was escape. It was a, you know, eight hour, 10 hour escape for me to, to go into the office and, and be around normalcy. Um, so I think that was, uh, I could have, I could have done a lot better. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to fool myself or fool anybody out there. I, I should have done more for myself. I, I caused myself some, um, uh, you know, they manifested into some, into some physical um, ailments from, from the, from the stress of the time. But, um, you know, so you can always do better. You can always think back and do better, but you do the best you can in that situation. And one of those um, escapes was actually going to the office and going to work. Definitely. Missy, did you have anything to chime in? Well, yeah, I think um, like Noah, I think we can all probably do a better job with our own mental health during this time. Um, I'm a counselor, and so I think I just naturally fall into that caregiving role, and I probably don't step out of it very easily. Um, I was probably really fortunate that Chris didn't get that sick, um, so we could still we could still live our lives a little bit. Um, I guess you know you kind of put on this happy face and positivity and and you do it day after day after day and and sure it's it's hard for some people i think i kind of naturally took to that position um i i have to say that i did i mean i i so remember checking him into pre-op and with his parents and you know you wheel into this cold room and get him all ready and then you know the goodbye was is really hard when you, when you step away. And that's kind of when I, I stepped into the elevator with his parents and it was like, Oh my God, I may never see him again. And so that's the part where I totally broke down and totally lost it. Like hyperventilating with his family, just like, Oh my God, like I really may never see him again. And so that, I mean, it did happen. You do break down and you do lose it as you can see. No, no, I appreciate the honesty. And I think that's really, you know, the, the surgery part of it and the whole, you know, wheeling into that room, I think is, is, I think we've heard from a lot of caregivers that we work with who volunteer for us. They all say the same thing that by far they'll take all the, you know, chronic illness stuff, but that part is the hardest part is watching them get wheeled into that operating room for sure. So, um, that said, you know, we're going to open the floor to Q&A. Um, if anybody has any questions, we've already gotten a few. Um, our first question, actually, um, uh, from Robin, I'm just wondering, as a transplant social worker, what would have been helpful in the way of support from the transplant teams, social work particularly, either before, during, or after transplant, if, if you guys could answer, or one of you guys could answer? I'll answer. You know what would have helped me is um, this was 21 years ago, and um, we have gone to support groups recently within the last five years. They've opened that up to um, calls to the patient or to the caregiver, um, Zoom calls. They didn't have anything like that that I could have, I, I think that would have been beneficial for me. I would have jumped on um, to educate myself even further. Um, so I think that would help just more support. Um, I feel like now in my role now, I help a lot of people, um, other wives, other, other, other spouses that, um, are going through the same thing and just put it out there. People need, they, I, I, that's all. Anyway, I think it's that it's the phone calls that are opening up now that are better than when I needed it. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, Kim, I think I think that's that's a really important piece of this 
is is the support effort. And it's really interesting, like like Valen says, she always wants to be the patient advocate she wishes she she wishes that she had when she was going through this as a, as a teenager. And you know, with you know the the good and bad of social media, but um, you know things like this webinar and things like some social media platforms where it's easier for communities to come together and connect and share those experiences and learn from each other and get support. And in times of crisis, reach out to somebody that really might know because your friends and family, as close as they are to you, as close as they are to your situation, they don't know exactly what it feels like to be in the trenches. And But to reach out to somebody that does and get that feedback that only that type of person can can give is, um, is you know, just, you know, it's amazing how, how transformative that can be for people as, as I'm sure you, you guys have seen at CKF is any of us that do um, outreach have, have seen or advocacy have seen it, it you know, you, you people come to you and are in, in, in this low spot and to be able to give them that glimmer of hope to keep going is, is what it's all about. Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's sort of the goal at CKF when we say we inspire uh, everyone within the transplant community. That's really what we strive to do. Missy, did you have something to uh, add? Yeah, I just, I, I think that, you know, we're, um, we're pretty fortunate to have a really strong family and, and friends, but, but there's plenty of people who are going through this process that just don't have uh, those connections. And um, I guess as a, you know, anytime, uh, you know, a person is alone going through this, I guess, reaching out to them and making sure they have um, somebody that they can check in with somebody that they feel like they have a connection with. And I don't, I mean, I don't know how you do that, but even if it's a, a, a recipient that is now healthy, that's been through the process, just somebody to check in with these people who are alone going through this with, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, you can't do it alone, right? That's, that's, I think the main takeaway of today. Oh, can I add something to this? Please. Um, uh, Brian and I were given the name of another firefighter who um, was needing a transplant. And um, we actually went to go see them. We do that a lot. We go to people's homes and sit with them. Well, when we went into the door, uh, the wife says to me, um, I don't know why you're here. And I said, well, um, I, we're just here to talk to Jim about his, you know, sickness and illness. Brian has, Brian knows all about this. And she says, um, nobody does this. And I said, well, I do, I do. So I go, you're gonna want my number when I leave. And I guarantee you, you will use that. And she goes, well, still, I don't see. It. And I said, no, you will just trust me. When I left, she took my number. She called me before I got on the freeway. And she goes, I apologize for that. And you know what? She, when he was in ICU at his, the lowest point, we had gone to see them. She, she used to call me from ICU going, she would text me and she'd go, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'm just going to say this. She'd go, I'm going to kill him. And I, I would text back, no, 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 no. Call me, call me. It's okay. So I feel like I had a little bit of a part in saving that marriage right there because I knew exactly what she was going through with that. So same time, same type personalities they both were. They would only talk to each other. Brian wouldn't talk to me. So anyway, I just had to add that. So no, that's great. And it really, it segues into our other questions that we've received. Um, David asked, um, have any of you been in a caregiver, specifically a caregiver support group, and was it helpful? I'll jump on there again. <laughs> there, there is no, I have never been to a caregiver support group. This is so needed. And um, I could have used it and I would have been, I didn't, I mean, gosh, we lived up in the mountains. We were all by ourselves. I didn't know, you know, I couldn't get him down to support groups for being a recipient. He would be sick all the way down there. You know, we, we got, we jumped into this with our God head first into this and had no idea how to, to do any of this. So I, I wasn't part of any caregiver. I would have welcomed it. Yeah, the, yeah, I, um, same same here, Pim. I mean, um, yeah, we, we talk about this a lot, actually. Val and I talk about this a lot. Not only and and not only you know pre-operation, pre-transplant, 
but post transplant. I mean, because there are hiccups that come up along the way, and uh, you know, everybody is kind of like, "Oh, well, you have your transplant, you're good now." And it 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 doesn't work that way. This this gift of life, this second chance, comes with some strings, as as we all know. And you know, there there really is, you know, even if even if there are some levels of support beforehand, you know, really after transplant, that really uh, uh, you know evaporates, and that, that's something that you know we. You know, both Valen and I, you know, try to advocate more for is more support um, post transplant as well, and and caregiver trans or caregiver support. Um, you know, like webinars like this, they they really, like you said, they really don't exist, and and it's um, something that is that the community needs. Definitely, and I think um, especially um, from what we've seen, you know, CKF, we, we work with a lot of hospitals, you know, nationwide. I think one of the biggest things that we've seen come out of our in-person patient ambassador program will visit patients, but another big thing that we do is visiting support groups. And more and more, we're seeing the availability of sort of offsets of like liver transplant support groups. A caregiver in one of those groups or a husband, wife of somebody in one of those support groups branches off and is like, well, what about us? You know, it's sort of, and now it's becoming so widespread, especially with social media. I think, as we've mentioned, you know, it's way more, and, you know, over the phone and Zoom, it's way more accessible as opposed to, you know, traveling to a hospital. If you live far away, it can be difficult. But, um, and just to segue, you know, Adriana asked, um, I think we, and I think we covered this, but, you know, while your loved ones are going through this difficult time, did any of you reach out to a community of other caregivers for support? I know, Kim, we talked about your relationship with um, the other firefighter and his wife. Um, and if so, you know, did that help you to cope? Noah, Missy, if you guys want to chime in, and if you, if you didn't, you know, reach out to other caregivers, do you wish that you had? Uh, Chris, you know, Chris reached out similar uh, to Brian. He, he reached out to Sean Elliott, who played in the NBA, had a kidney transplant, and then came back to play in the NBA. And he needed to know, because Chris asked his transplant doc right away, like, hey, I'm, I want to go to the Olympics. Mike is, can I do this transplant? And his, his uh, surgeon was like, uh, I don't know. We've never done this before on an Olympian. Like, we're just, you know, go for it. Um, and so for Chris, it was really important to talk to somebody who had gone back to, you know, sports on his level. And, and we didn't know if it was possible or not, but he was going to work as hard as he could before transplant and after transplant. Um, and speaking to Sean Elliott was like changed his whole perspective on this. Like he did it. Huh, I could do this, you know? Um, and it, I think it helped us both because here was an example and it really lightened Chris's, his mood and, and gave him the, the positive feedback um, from Sean really, really helped that he knew it was possible, you know? And it was a big sigh of relief to me. Like, oh, thank God. It's a, this is a good story and a good ending. And, you know, we can all believe and hope through Sean that this can happen with us. Yeah, lead by example, that sort of, that sort of uh, thing goes a long way for a lot of people. I know Chris himself has played that role for a lot of transplant recipients out there. So I think it's awesome to carry on that sort of legacy of helping others through such hard times. So thank you, Missy, for sharing. Um, if uh, Kim, Noah, did you guys have something to add or we have another question, um, but if you guys have anything. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm, you know, I think it depends on the personality. I'm, I'm, I'm an internal person uh, for the most part. And, um, you know, I like to try to solve problems on my own. So, uh, you know, I, I probably should have, I mean, it, you know, and I, and I think that goes to the, the, the change in accessibility. Because you know most care groups, most support groups were at were at hospitals, and when you're going through these, you know, when you're going through pre-transplant and, and all the struggles that come with it, you're not you don't necessarily have the extra energy to drive 45 minutes each way to go to a support group, um, let alone take your loved one with you or leave them at home by themselves. So I think that it was kind of out of the question for us. Um, I think that it's my personality that I, even if it was available, I don't know if I would have done it, but in hindsight, 
it probably would have helped cope and would have been a good outlet for, you know, just like, you know, you know, Kim had said, you know, people saying, oh, I wanted to kill him. I mean, I never got to that point with Alan, but sometimes I would get to the point where she was super sick and she would walk to the mailbox and come back and be laying on the couch and call me because she was just so exhausted. And I'm like, why did you do that? <laughs> why did you go get the mail? But it was, it was just part of her coping with it as well. But that to, to talk to other people that had similar stories to that, to understand what the patients were, were going through and trying to do as well as what we're trying to internalize ourselves, I think would have been beneficial. So hindsight, I did 2020 and I probably wish I would have done something more. Yeah, definitely, definitely, I, I get that. And that's definitely who Valen is too. <laughs> the getting the mail is like the perfect way to describe her, I think. <laughs> can, can I add something here? Please. This, this was my introduction to this whole thing. I just moved in with Brian and I had no idea about any of this. And he crawls, literally crawls out of the bedroom, throws himself on the ground. Now we had just, I just moved in. He says, run to the store and get vitamin K and four heads of cabbage. And I said, what? He goes, just go. So I ran and I, I, I've got the vitamin K in my hand and I've got the four, I'm, I'm checking out the grocery store with my four heads of cabbage. And I know the manager there and he says, you can make some coleslaw. And I said, I don't think so. He goes, are you trying to stop a bleed? I said, I don't know. Am I? I go home. I held up the cabbage. I said, are we bleeding somewhere? He goes, you don't need to know. I said, oh, no, no. This ends now. So that was my introduction to this whole thing. So thought I'd share that because that kind of set the stage for me. And I thought I'm in for the fight of my life to actually not. Well, OK, I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you for sharing, Kim. Yeah, yeah, you're sort of like lost in the woods and you feel like it's very specific to your condition, your loved one's condition, but yet there's a whole network of people out there that are going through, you know, almost the exact same thing and it's important to connect. I think that's that's another huge takeaway from this. Um, we have another question we have from David. Um, this is sort of COVID uh, specific. It is COVID specific. Um, what tips can you guys share about caring for your spouse, uh, you know, as a transplant recipient after transplant, you know, related to travel, eating out, keeping safe in general during the last crazy year of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with this. I mean, you know, Valen, my wife's been very, very active in this. Um, she's been working with Johns Hopkins and some other um, centers with, uh, in regards to COVID health for patients. She's part of the, the Johns Hopkins research study on, um, you know, development of antibodies in, in transplant recipients, immunosuppressed uh, transplant recipients. And so really, I think it really comes down to everybody, everybody's interpretation of risk. You know, there every, we all have this risk versus life um, balance, and it, it's really hard. We, we're not getting really direct guidance from CDC. Our doctors are kind of, yes, one doctor, they say one thing, the other doctor says another. And, and really it's, it's because all of us interpret risk differently. Um, you know, there's people that are super social that they need that in their lives, that not having that is very detrimental. So it's finding out what that risk is. Um, for us personally, it's, um, you know, just being so fresh out of the, her, her second transplant um, coming up on three years. Uh, and, and it being a little fresher in our minds, we're a little bit more risk avoidant. We have we have other friends that are transplant recipients that are flying to the Caribbean and going out to eat outdoors. And, you know, and really we, we you know, we really, it's hard to, but we try, we, we, we can't pass judgment on what those other people are doing because it's all their perception and their comfortability with risk. So, you know, I think it's really weigh your options look at the COVID numbers around you, you know, are there a lot of cases? Are there not a lot of cases? How risky is your activity? Is it indoors, outdoors? A lot of people, few people, and, and really just try to um, gauge and do your best. Um, you know, we're all trying to figure out how we ease or, you know, some people sprint back into normalcy and um, just, uh, I, you know, figuring out that risk tolerance and, and um, you know, doing what makes you feel safe and not feeling pressured and I'm trying to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. 
Definitely. Yeah. And it's very like any transplant um, and uh, caregiving situation. It's very case specific, as you said, Noah. Um, I think, you know, with the antibody tests that are coming out now with the vaccine, sometimes a transplant recipient who receives is fully vaccinated, they don't have the antibodies after being vaccinated. Some do. So it's very um, case specific, I think. And I think that's a really important thing to remember when looking at the transplant community as a whole. Um, so thank you, Noah, for, for sharing. I think that's an important thing to mention for sure. Um, and one last question we have, um, and I think this is ending on the perfect uh, positive note here. Um, what was the highest point of your caregiving experience or your time as a caregiver? Um, it was an anonymous question, so I just am gonna put it out there into the void. What was your, you know, we talked about the most challenging with you, Noah, and I think we've touched upon it with Kim and Missy. What was the best time in that whole experience? Well, I can tell you that the best time is kind of obvious for us. Um, Chris coming back, I guess there's the first time he was back on snow, which, you know, was crazy, like six weeks after his transplant or something crazy. Um, that was definitely, and he took, I remember he was on Mount Hood training back with his team who barely even knew that he had a liver condition and that he had had a transplant. Um, and he came back and he got on snow and was training at Mount Hood. And, you know, I'm watching him and he took a huge crash. And I was just picturing his abdomen, like ripping in half, like, oh, my God, how can you handle this? You know, and and he was fine. And so that was one point for sure. And then obviously him making the Olympic team and and really that day of competing. Um, and it was really we were fortunate. We were in Salt Lake City and at the bottom of his, uh, he talks about it all the time, but you know, at the bottom of the race course it, uh, were his doctors, his, um, his donor family, uh, they were there. He hadn't met them yet, but they were there, they were watching. Um, doctors and family and friends, and we had so many people there that had helped us through that process. So, I mean, that was just a culmination of all this, you know, this giant, process that we've been through and um, to have it all play out and everybody be together and that was really really special yeah. well for me can I jump in here <laughs> yes um, um Brian uh, when when Brian had the transplant uh, Megan was two and they used to have he we really didn't want her touching him so much or anything so they used to do a secret this every every time every he'd go to the hospital he was in the hospital so many times and they had a special and they growl they would go ooh. so i think my favorite one of my one of my moments that i thought we were going to be together as a family is when and the film crew it's in the documentary they actually captured it um he sees her at the door and he just had the transplant and the nurse is telling her don't and he goes no i need her and when he walked when she walked in and they did that and they growled i thought oh i think we're gonna be okay and um after that they still do it they still have the same growl and um so as you can see this is still it'll, it'll never go away these feelings that you have um when he was in surgery we didn't know and so like missy said you just don't know so these will never go away so i don't know i think you know what i'd like to say is if anybody out there is watching this just reach out to people because they need it i know i did so anyway that's what i wanted to say okay. Thank you, Kim. I'm now you got me. You got the moderator crying. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> oh man. Well, um, Noah, did you have anything? You know, your highest point. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a minute to collect yourself, Cece. Uh, I, I I think it goes along with everybody. I think the hardest point. You work so hard. You 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 have a hand in your help in the in the help of your loved one up until the point where those doors close and they go into, into the surgery room. And, and, you know, like Missy said, you don't know if they're coming back. And that is a, 
incredibly, you have to let go and trust that all of the work you put in, all the time and the center you've chosen, the doctors, they're going to do um, the right thing and it's all going to work out right. Um, so I think the, the best thing was, you know, Valen has a very complicated case. Um, so, and we had to relocate to St. Louis for a transplant, and for her liver transplant. And so I go out and I'm just, I'm trying to keep my mind off things. So I'm just, I'm, I'm walking around, I'm, I'm probably five blocks away from the surgery center eating lunch. And I'm thinking it's going to take, you know, eight hours, 14 hours, because her abdomen's been through several surgeries. And they call me at six hours and they tell me to come back. So I book it across the campus and get there and they tell me everything went, uh, you know, everything went great. And that feeling of relief was just, un, you know, unbelievable. I mean, just, just that was probably the, the, the high point, you know, you've worked so hard and then to have them say that everything went as it, as it should and went perfectly actually is what they said is, is you couldn't, you couldn't ask for anything better. So that was, you know, that was the high point as well as then, you know, a couple of years later, being able to go back to the center and have Valen speak on behalf of the 10,000 transplants that they completed at that center to speak on behalf of the patients was uh, just a real full circle culmination of, of everything we went through. Yeah, definitely. A lot of hard work and, you know, and it's, totally 100% worth it. I think that's another important takeaway from today's um, discussion. And I thank you guys all for being so open and um, you know, sharing these deeply personal experiences with us um, and to, the, to everyone who's attending today. We really appreciate all of you guys, Noah, Kim, Nassi, for being here uh, today um, and for joining us and for sharing your, your stories and your loved ones' stories as well. So. Um, with that, and I wanted to, Kim, uh, I included your um, uh, uh, link to the No Greater Love documentary. That is in the chat. So if you guys, uh, everyone, uh, the audience uh, wants to watch it, it's listed in the chat. And also we've listed uh, the CKF website as well. So um, if you guys want to go check that out, I promise it's it's amazing. I've seen it myself. So I highly recommend. Um, but yeah, with that, I guess, um, you know, the goal of the webinar today was to highlight, you know, the integral role that uh, of, of the transplant caregiver and, you know, the incredible responsibilities they take on to ensure their loved one's recovery. And I think we've definitely covered uh, those responsibilities and the craziness, the ups and downs, highs and lows. Um, but, you know, if, if any uh, anybody in attendance had any questions that were not addressed or answered in today's webinar, you know, please do not hesitate to contact us. Um, I'll include actually uh, an email in the chat real quick. Pardon me. You can contact us at info at chrisclugfoundation.org. Um, and we can also put you in touch with the panelists as well. Um, if you guys have any more specific or more personal questions, um, we'd be happy to connect you there. Um, and, you know, if you're interested in learning more about, you know, the Chris Kluge Foundation, please check out our website. Um, and yeah, we hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, stay healthy. And thank you guys again, everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate it.